Hello everyone, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, which sit on the ancestral lands of the Choctaw prior to their forced removal. If you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. I note with sadness the death of our friend, Dr. Dick Johnson, along with his wife, Margaret. Dick was a fixture at History's Lunch, and I've missed seeing them here as we have returned to in-person. A memorial service will be held for Dr. Johnson in July. Please come back for History's Lunch next Wednesday when Rice University professor Faye A. Yarbrough will be talking about her new book, Choctaw Confederates, The American Civil War in Indian Country. Today, we're delighted to have with us John M. Shaw, who will present the South's black fife and drum tradition. John M. Shaw is an ethnomusicologist and a music researcher, writer, musician, composer, and blogger. He holds an MA in musicology from the University of Memphis, where he's currently a graduate assistant and doctoral student. Following the Drums, African-American Fife and Drum Music in Tennessee, published by University Press of Mississippi, is his first book. Shaw is at work on Action Speaks Louder Than Words, African-American Music, and the Recording Industry in Shreveport, 1948 to 1998. Help me welcome John Shaw. All right, it's quite a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, this is my first time doing this kind of a presentation and in front of this large crowd. Um, my book is about this fife and drum tradition as it exists in the state of Tennessee, which may seem a little uh, counterintuitive. Like I think many of you in this room, I grew up viewing this music as something unique to the state of Mississippi. So you can imagine my shock to discover that this was actually a ubiquitous form of black music, particularly in the period of Reconstruction. And as I did research into this music, I found evidence for it in the state of Florida, the state of Georgia, the state of Alabama, uh, the state of Louisiana, and very much in the state of Tennessee. I have not found conclusive proof of it in the state of Arkansas, but I think that uh, with sufficient research, it probably would surface there as well, and perhaps in the state of Texas. So this music was far more widespread, and I think that what we have to basically come to the conclusion is that it lasted longer in the state of Mississippi than anywhere else. Uh, died out in Georgia in 1970, uh, disappeared from my state of Tennessee by about 83 to 85, uh, was last documented for sure in Tallahassee in Florida in about 92 or 93, which isn't that long ago, but not can't find any evidence that it's continuing. So the, these, uh, this music was once everywhere. And so basically, as I work, worked on this, I began to look into its roots. How did this come about? How did we get a black fife and drum tradition? And, uh, you know, how did this come about? And then what became of it? And so basically, uh, the obvious thing, anybody who's heard the genre, we'll listen to a video later, is that this music is, uh, has a very West African sound, uh, perhaps more so than any other African American form of music. And that's been noted. And basically, what appears to have happened is that in being brought to this strange place, as you would if you were brought to some place you were not familiar, you would look you would grasp at anything you saw that did seem familiar. And the state militias in the United States used drums and they used fifes. These are probably the two most ubiquitous instruments in West Africa. There certainly are others. There are stringed instruments such as the kora 
and many others, but drums and fifes were used for various festivals. There's a festival music in West Africa called Jongo, which uses drums and flutes. And so basically this would have seemed familiar to people who had been brought from Africa to the southeast of the United States. And we have accounts of the impact that drums and fifes had on uh, people that had been brought from Africa. As early as the 1820s in Rutherford County, Tennessee, Murfreesboro, uh, an account from someone that was growing up at that period of time that uh, these men had been brought from Africa and whenever they heard a drum and fife making martial music, they would quit working and follow the drummer and the fifer until the music stopped, which is a very interesting account. Uh, we also have accounts, incredibly, of drummers uh, in the state militias, black drummers in the South, which I was very doubtful. Even when I read the claim in a textbook, I was like, I'm not thinking that this would have been permitted. After all, there had been drums used in the Stono Rebellion, and after that, South Carolina made it illegal for African Americans to own drums, so it seemed odd that uh, there would have been black drummers in the militias, but I found plenty of evidence from Southern newspapers in the 1830s and 40s, and right on up until the dawn of the Civil War. And amazingly, there were black drummers in Confederate home guards and state militias that fought on the side of the South. That's even stranger. And I wouldn't have believed that until I saw it in print with my own eyes. Here, uh, Jackson, Mississippi is one of the places where such a band was mentioned um, and kind of getting in a dig at the Confederates by playing a song, Jimmy Crack Corn and I Don't Care, which the next line would, would have been, my master's gone away. <laughs> so they were probably playing a little subtle musical joke as the troops were leaving uh, Jackson to go to war. Uh, very interesting. Uh, at any rate, there were, of course, also black drummers on the Union side as well, uh, particularly after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, which allowed black men to join the United States Army. And uh, so this music developed, and uh, this was a perfect storm because these instruments were familiar to these men. And... Uh, on the other hand, the authorities that were running the armies and militia units said, these guys are good at this. They're good at blowing these flutes and playing these snare drums and bass drums. By the way, uh, the snare drums were called kettle, kettle drums, and, and still are in the, amongst older people in Panola and Tate counties. And uh, the bass drums are usually just called drums or big drums. And the fife, uh, older people often call it a fife as if it were spelled F-I-C-E, and you still hear that. Uh, but this music becomes something far more than military. And we'll progress here. So this is the book that I have written on the subject in Tennessee, and these are some pictures of some of the last fife and drum bands that existed in Tennessee. But we'll start here and see that this became something pretty ubiquitous. We start seeing these fifes and drums in political campaigns, and notice that this ad here for Hollenberg's Music House says, drums and fifes for campaign cheap. <laughs> and likewise up here for sale, drums and fifes, $25 per set, consisting of one bass, one tenor, and one fife, all calf heads and sticks complete. Send in your orders. Um, this was particularly done by the Republican Party because the Republican Party was the party of trying to be at least the party of recently freed slaves and poor white yeoman farmers who had never owned slaves, and they were hoping to build this huge, this interracial alliance of, uh, you know, poor whites and former slaves along with those who had moved into the South from the North. And so they were using these drums and fifes for their rallies and for the meetings of the Loyal League, as it was called, or the Union Leagues. And it was the 
black men and women that were involved in these organizations that would hold decoration days, like the one advertised over on the far left, uh, to honor the Union dead. They said, these are the people that helped us get free, so we should honor them by decorating their graves. And they went to the National Cemetery in Memphis, which still exists, and they decorated the graves of the Union dead. And they would bring their bands, and of course, the organization that sponsored this was called the Independent Pole Bearers, and I've discussed in my book, in later years, there was a tendency to change over to calling it independent Paul bearers, but there is ample evidence, in my opinion, that pole bearers was not an error, even though it was considerably ridiculed later, but was actually the name of the organization because they drilled with pikes, with wooden pikes and sticks, and in military formation with drums. So I think this is interesting. This was a benevolent society that provided for its members, including burial, and is sort of analogous to today's social aid and pleasure clubs in New Orleans. But this music continues. Uh, it becomes not only something that had to do with uh, the militias, but it becomes something that is done at picnics and at, even at funerals. Uh, this band is the Broadnax Brothers Band. They, are from, they were from Fayette County of Tennessee near Mason, which is actually in Tipton County, but it's in the same general vicinity. And this was a picture of a picture. The uh, folklorist Robert Jeffrey was visiting in Fayette County and saw this picture in someone's house, and they allowed him to take a picture of it. This is one of the oldest pictures of a fife and drum band I've seen. It, uh, dating, I would tend to think from the dress of the men that it probably dates from the 50s, maybe older than that. Um, this, through these benevolent societies that existed, um, the drums and fife bands were hired to play for the funerals, and they also signaled when certain things were taking place. A certain beat called the dead lick was beat on the bass drum to announce that someone in the organization had passed away. And this continued really up into the early 50s or mid 50s in my county, Shelby County, Tennessee. Uh, black people didn't have telephones. Uh, maybe one person on a road would have a telephone. So by having the bass drummer go to the picnic grounds and beat the bass drum in a certain pattern that everyone knew meant a death, then the marshals of the organization would go out originally on horseback and later on by truck or car and knock on doors of members and tell them, oh, Ms. Williams passed. And they would be, you know, and the members of the society had to attend the funeral or be fined. That's the way it worked. People didn't have life insurance and the young men would be recruited at age 15 or 16 to join, and they often had to dig the graves. And this is how these societies worked. But the monthly dues did not pay enough to maintain the cemeteries, and so these organizations began sponsoring picnics. And a picnic might start on a Thursday night, run all night long, all day Friday, all night Friday, all day Saturday, and into Sunday morning when it would finally cut off because people were supposed to go to church. The independent pole bearers did not allow you to join if you were not a Christian. It was written in their uh, contract. So basically, you know, they were church people, despite how raucous some of these picnics could get. <laughs> And the Broadnecks brothers were very famous. They played the Brunswick picnic every year in Shelby County. They played the Belmont picnic in Fayette. Uh, they were active into the mid-60s, maybe into the late 60s. But Jethro Broadnecks and, uh, got died, and then his brother, O.C. Broadnecks, got sick. Fortunately, Bent Olson, the Swedish musicologist, recorded O.C. Broadnecks before he died. And so there is uh, an extant recording called Don't the Peaches Look Mellow, which appears on the Old Country Blues CD. Uh, I've met some grandchildren of the Broadnax family who told me something about it. They would ride around in a wagon with a bass drum on the back, beating the bass drum on Friday. People would hear that 
and it was a way of advertising. Okay, there's going to be a picnic tomorrow. And people knew by hearing that bass drum and seeing it pulled on a wagon behind mules that there was going to be a picnic the next day. And these are people that are recalling this in the 50s. So it was still going on. Um, not far from where the Broadnecks band was was the Fredonia fife and drum band, which was based near Stanton. And if you notice, this one was unique in that this was a lodge of Prince Hall Masons. We don't see that as often. Most of the fife and, in fact, this is the only fife and drum band I've encountered in any state that was associated with a lodge of, the, uh, a, of Masons. And they noticed that the Masonic compass is on the bass drum. Uh, this band uh, existed near Stanton, Tennessee, in Haywood County, even though Fredonia is actually straddles the line between Haywood and Fayette and uh, had largely become moribund by about 1974. Now, when Mark and Judy Mikulis came down from New York, along with uh, Ben Olson and Bill Barth from Memphis, well, really not originally from Memphis, but living in Memphis at the time, they recorded a band that they called the Fredonia Band, but it, it, it really was not. It contained Hallie Massey, who was from the Fredonia Band, but it also contained Plez Rivers, the father of Homesick James, who was from the Broadnecks band, the picture before, <laughs> and, it, and Lum Guffin, who was from Bartlett, where I live, and was a member of yet another band, the United Sons and Daughters of Zion. But they record this rump group they've kind of run, brought together from the remnants of three former bands, and they record it and film it and say it's the Fredonia band, I guess because they were at Fredonia when they did the filming. This was for an abortive movie project that never finished, and the materials from it have been lost, unfortunately. Lum Guffin, the man I just mentioned, blowing the fife in that 1974 film effort that we can't seem to find anything from, was mainly a guitar player, a very good one. His name was Columbus Lum Lucky Guffin, he was from Bartlett. I went to high school with his grandson, Bobby Merriweather, and did not know at the time that he was this man's grandson. Uh, Lum recorded an album, a wonderful album, playing guitar called Walking Victrola that was actually recorded by Ben Olson, probably at Lum's house in Bartlett in 1973. It was released on the Fly Right label. But Lum was an interesting man because he played the guitar, fife, drums, piano, and mandolin. <laughs> and this picture was sent to me by Stefan Mickelson, who calls himself Delta X and is a well-known political activist, or not really activist, but a, a consultant. But he's also an amateur blues musician and enthusiast, and he loves it. And this is a wonderful picture of Lum on the porch of his house. But this is also Lum with his band that is called the United Sons and Daughters of Zion, Fife and Drum Band, number nine. <laughs> and uh, there were, uh, going back in Reconstruction newspapers, there was a United Sons of Zion, which appeared in the black community of Memphis in about 1869 or 70. And then a year or two later, there's a Daughters of Zion. And you get these listings of parades and the Sons of Zion, and then there's a band, and then there's the Daughters of Zion. Well, a few years after that, already they were saying, why was there men in the middle of the Daughters of Zion with a banner? And, you know, because they were apparently were already sort of fraternally related. And then a few years later, you start seeing them described as the United Sons and Daughters of Zion. So they just quit trying to be separate and they merged it all the way together. Number one chapter was on Beale Street in Memphis. But how many chapters there were, I don't know. There's a tantalizingly an office in Atlanta today that says United Sons and Daughters of Zion, but nobody ever answers the phone and nobody ever called me back. <laughs> at any rate, number nine was at Prosperity Baptist Church, Missionary Baptist Church in Bartlett, where Lum Guffin was a member. And apparently that chapter was founded by his father, Butler Guffin. I found the charter. The, the commercial appeal even mentions the charter, but it mistakenly calls the man Butler Griffin. 
Lum's family owned 300 acres of prime bottomland for growing cotton and corn near the Lusatchee River. How they acquired it, I don't know, but there's a reconstruction ad for a guffin uh, in Bartlett who self-described himself as a colored bookkeeper. So these were educated people, and there's some evidence that the Guffins came to Tennessee from South Carolina as free men. Uh, I haven't been with, there's so many Guffins in South Carolina, both white and black, that I haven't been able to trace them further than that. But Butler Guffin founded the United Sons and Daughters of Zion sometime in the 1880s in Bartlett, and this was the grandson, now Lum, that is running it. So this band is the only Tennessee fife and drum band to have been filmed as far that we can find. And there is a video, and if we could have that video played now, you'll get an idea of what Lum and the United Sons and Daughters of Zion sounded like. That's pretty, pretty good. That's pretty, that's pretty, that's enough of it, I think. So we get the idea. And this is interesting because anybody that's heard the Mississippi tradition will notice how completely different that is from what we're used to hearing from, let's say, Otha Turner or uh, Napoleon Strickland. Uh, and that we, we might think, well, Tennessee fife and drum must have been remarkably different. Uh, so basically, if we can get back to our PowerPoint here, 
but uh, basically the Tennessee style may have been more like the Mississippi except for Lum. We think this is a very, uh, the Hallie Massey of the Fredonia band told Ben Olsen, he said, Lum's music is very archaic, it's old, it's disciplined, and it's like a drum and bugle corps. For his part, Lum told Bent, he said, Hallie Massey and them, they're wild. Their music is wild and out of control. So Lum was maintaining a tradition that may have really been what we would have heard if we'd been in Reconstruction. I mean, it, it, it's very military-based. There's Some of it is in 6-8 time signature, which is just not something you see in the Mississippi tradition. I have transcribed that piece and you see it here and another one he played to kind of show how different. He alternates between 4-4 four, four time and triplets that give the feel of 6-8 time. And uh, that's just not some, something we might see in, you know, Sousa marches, but it's not something we normally would see in the black fife and drum tradition. W it seems as if Lum really preserved a very archaic form of this music. And what's even more interesting is, of course, the fife he had, he had in the video uh, is now in the possession of his grandson, Bobby Merriweather, and was given to him by his father, who had gotten it from Butler. So this was an old metal fife. He had a rosewood fife as well. Uh, where he got it, I don't know. But one thing I kept running into as I detailed this story is that most of these guys originally made their fifes of bamboo cane. Uh, they would actually go out in a creek bottom and pluck the cane and cut it a certain length, lick, lick their fingers and place it on the cane, which would show them where to burn the holes, and they would hollow that cane out and burn a hole to blow in. And this is, was originally what they would be blowing was a piece of cane. Now, but the stories keep popping up where after they had blown that cane publicly, with the drummers at different places, picnics, parties, trade days, they would often be given a fife by a white man. You just see that story repeated, repeated. He, eventually he was given a metal fife by a white man at a party. <laughs> and uh, that's interesting to me. But that, uh, is that how Butler acquired his metal fife? We don't know. But uh, those who appreciated the music would, would, would occasionally give the fife blower a metal fife or a expensive wooden one. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. The independent pole bearers eventually do give in to starting to call themselves pole bearers. They were ridiculed mercilessly by the white press for the name pole bearers. I don't know why that was considered amusing, I guess because they thought they tried to say pole bearer and didn't get it. But that's not the case. I've proven in my book that they meant to say pole bearers. And the founder's, the founder's grave, Thomas Swan, in the uh, Zion Cemetery in Memphis, it says in the marble, founder of the independent pole bearers, P-O-L-E. There's no doubt that they, they weren't going to make that kind of mistake in marble of their founder's grave. They meant to say pole bearers. But uh, over time, nobody, people probably don't even realize the difference because everybody says IPB. They don't even try to name it. So it's IPB Society Number 6 in Brunswick. They sponsored the big picnic that Lum played at every year up until about 1974. Why did the picnics stop? And this is interesting stuff. Lum said part of the problem was life insurance. And you think, why would life insurance destroy a style of music? Well, back in Reconstruction, black people couldn't get life insurance. The new life insurance companies that were being founded in the South were being founded by ex-Confederates. The biggest one, one of the biggest ones, was called the Southern Life Insurance Company, and its president at the time was living in Memphis. His name was Jefferson Davis. You might have heard of him. Um, as a result, black people just couldn't get life insurance. These companies wouldn't sell it to them. So they formed these societies, like this one, independent pallbearers, and you paid your dues, and you knew that if you died, they would take care of your wife and your kids. You knew that they would bury you with music. In the cities like Jackson, it was probably a brass band, but in places like Canton or Kosciuszko, it was a fife and drum band. They, they, they didn't have the brass instruments. They didn't have the money to buy the brass instruments. 
Eventually they do. By the 1890s, you start seeing black cornet bands everywhere or brass bands, but this is later. So, but what happens? Well, you start getting black life insurance companies. You start getting the, you know, the uh, North Carolina Mutual. You start getting the uh, uh, standard life of Louisiana. You start getting the universal life insurance in Memphis. And, I mean, these are wonderful things. These are making, you know, some first black millionaires off of life insurance. They may see a walker, et cetera, but there's a downside. People said, oh, it's easier to pay my premium and I don't have to dig a grave and they don't ask me to be treasurer next year and I don't, and I don't get fined if I don't go to every funeral. And uh, eventually people start buying life insurance and they quit paying dues to the societies, quit joining. By the 60s, it's gotten crucial. You got 70, everybody in society is 60, 70, 80 years old. The young men don't want to join. They're, they're not interested in this music either. It doesn't enthuse them. It's not, in, it's not like Chuck Berry. It's not like uh, James Brown or, uh, you know, which is what they're hearing on the radio. Electricity has come. There's radios. There's television. Uh, if the closer they live to a city like Memphis, the rap more rapidly this style of music is fading. And the societies don't do the picnic. They get to where they're not doing the picnics. Plus, Roy Brewer, I interviewed him. His name is on that sign. He said, people started coming to our picnic under the influence of drugs and alcohol. That's a sad commentary. He said, so much so that we started having fights. And he said that we own the land on which the picnic was held, and if somebody had gotten killed, we could be held legally responsible, so we made the reluctant decision to quit holding the picnic. Sad. Oh, what happens? Did I hit something I wasn't? Yeah. Okay. There wasn't just IPB number six. There was IPB number nine, which was at Capeville, on the uh, what was then called the Pigeon Roost Road that led toward Olive Branch. There was a huge roost of passenger pigeons at the state line, hence the name. Later, Memphis said, it's not urbane to have a road called Pigeon Roost in our city. So they renamed it for Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus Lamar. And uh, today it's Lamar Avenue, at least as far as the state line. But out there in Capeville, near Capeville, at the Chulahoma Road and what is now Shelby Drive was a picnic grounds called Faulkner Grove. And that's where we think this picture was taken. That's Jesse James Smith, who was president of IPV number nine, beating the bass drum. And fortunately, although I never got to meet him, he was extensively interviewed by the Commercial Appeal in 1976 about his independent pole bearers chapter. And it filled up half a newspaper page and had a picture of their banner. Unfortunately, Gannett owns the Commercial Appeal and, and wanted to charge me an exorbitant amount of money to quote from the article or use the picture. So neither took place, but this is the same organization. This chapter still exists, as does IPB6. And although their lodge hall burned a couple of years ago, they built a pavilion in its place in, at their cemetery. Uh, the presence of two bass drums is somewhat unusual and suggests that this might have been their last picnic. This group is even more interesting. Robert Jeffries found that there were remnants of a fife and drum band left in Fayette County in 1980. And he went there and interviewed the men involved and, even, and took this picture of them standing on the porch of a former gas station on Highway 59 and this is not far from Mason either. There's evidence that this area between Mason, Stanton, Fredonia, right in this corner, about halfway between Brownsville, Covington, and Somerville, all right in the dead center of those three towns, was a hotbed of this kind of activity. Ed Harris was the fife player, and he had tried to form a band from the rump of the what was left over from the Broadnax and Fredonia bands. When those bands just disintegrated, he tries to gather the musicians that are left and continue this. There were a bunch of huge black picnics in Fayette, uh, the Hall picnic and the l and N picnic, named for the railroad it was held beside, uh, were both really big events, and the Owens picnic, which even Honey Boy Edwards remembered playing at 
in near Oakland, Tennessee. So these, this is where this picture was taken. But unfortunately, he only got one recording that it has the drums and the fife together. He got a lot of recordings of Ed Harris just playing the fife by himself and singing. But only one recording made at Chickasaw State Park uh, during a festival does he have the fife and drums playing together. And it's very tentative and out of phase. I could not find any of these men now. Ed Harris was only 35 years old in 1980, and I was hoping I could locate him. But Fayette is undergoing this bizarre transition. It, was one, it once was the county with the highest percentage of African Americans in the United States. That is certainly not the case anymore. It's now a white majority county and becoming a bedroom community for Memphis. And uh, subdivisions have taken over a lot of the old locations where things were going on. So I could not find anyone left from this band. But those, are, those guys down here at the left are also members. That's Ed Harris with the Fife. And so, so uh, this basically was the very last such band, as far as we can tell, that went on in Tennessee. By 1980, it's gone. So the question becomes, you know, we already mentioned some of the factors. The bands were tied to the societies. When people quit joining the societies, then the picnics were no longer held, and that's where the bands were hired to play. So without the picnics, the bands begin to kind of fizzle out. The young people don't want to pick up the drums and the fife, and so basically this begins to disintegrate. Why did it not disintegrate in Mississippi? That's the interesting thing. We're talking about Memphis being the big city. And the answer is kind of an odd one. Actually, it did. It did disintegrate in Mississippi. Uh, DeSoto County, you won't find it. It doesn't exist anywhere in DeSoto. It was huge in the late 60s because Kenny Brown, the blues guitarist, remembers it. It was going on across the road from his house near Pleasant Hill. Not anymore. Marshall County, it was everywhere in the early 70s. You won't find a bit of fife and drum in Marshall County anymore unless Chardet happens to go over there to play an event. Um, doesn't go on in Benton. Used to go on in Benton. Used to go on everywhere in Benton County. Doesn't happen over there anymore. Why does it still persist in Tate and Panola? And the only answer I can really give is that one of the factors that seemed to determine whether it was going to last or die out is how close you were to the big city. So if you were right on the borders of Memphis, it wasn't going to last. There were two different factors affecting it. Uh, access to Memphis radio and television, access to electricity, uh, the tendency of black people to leave those counties and move into Memphis, uh, and the tendency of the, and the, and the, and the return, in other words, white people leaving Memphis and moving into those counties in the form of subdivisions that destroyed picnic grounds and old churches and locations and started making DeSoto look like a city and not a rural agricultural county, that all had a negative impact. And it seems as if that was the biggest factor. Tate and Panola, a little bit further away from Memphis. You know, I mean, you're still relatively close, but you know, almost an hour if you're talking about Sardis and Batesville and still predominantly rural, still predominantly agricultural, and this tradition was very, very deep-seated in those counties. There's some evidence that it might have also persisted for a long time in the area around Tallulah, Louisiana, and Natchez, Mississippi, and you can certainly hear it if you listen to Hezekiah early. If you listen to Hezekiah and the House Rockers, even though he's playing a set drum, you hear this fife and drum patterns in his drumming. You, you, if you hear a song recorded by Fat Possum called Let It All Go, you can really hear it. Uh, I think that it went on there for quite a while. Does it still? I don't think so. But, it, you know, I live in hope. I live in constant hope that on some back road, maybe in Tennessee, maybe in Mississippi, I'll encounter an unknown fife and drum. I mean, a few years ago, I encountered one. Uh, I thought that Charday Thomas was the only standard bearer left of this music. And to my amazement, a guy in New York started talking about a band I knew nothing of called the Hurt Family. I didn't know anything about the Hurt Family. And come to find out, they were doing a, their own fife and drum picnic at Burdett Hill, west of Sardis, every 
Memorial Day or Fourth of July or Labor Day. And uh, so, you know, for a while at the R.L. Boyce picnic, we had both the Hurt family and the uh, and Chardet. And uh, it was amazing to have more than one fife and drum band at that event. So I think, you know, the Tennessee Arts Commission actually uh, was trying a de-extinction program, trying to get fife and drum back, and they mentored a young woman uh, in Brownsville uh, toward that end. And, uh, but it just kind of remains to be seen whether that's going to take. And, uh, you know, hopefully it will, you know, if, if some young people get interested in this, because it could have died out with Otha, except that his granddaughter was just determined to keep this going. And I think that's a wonderful thing. But uh, there, ha there, you know, you can't just have one or two bands. It's, it's definitely endangered. But then again, you have to remember the brass band culture was down to pretty much the Fairview Baptist Church brass band under Danny Barker. And suddenly there's the Dirty Dozen, the Rebirth, and then the TBC and the Stooges and the Hot Eight. And now, I mean, the culture is thriving. So it can be done. You can get down to almost one or two bands and it just seems like it's going to play out. But if enough young people like the culture and say, hey, I want to rejuvenate this, then perhaps it does have a future. And at that point, I think uh, we will uh, open it up for questions. And if you hold your hand up, I think they're going to bring a mic to you. And uh, you can ask away. Questions? Yeah, I was wondering about how much when you, were, excuse me, you were looking for uh, drumming among African Americans in the South in the pre-1865. Uh, and of course, we, we always talk in blues culture about how drums were banned and talk about the exception in New Orleans, right, with, uh, uh, you know, the, with the um, dancing there on Sundays. How much did, did you find any evidence of music being played at private or, or events, were African-American events, the fife and drum? Not prior to the war. And... Um, but then I wasn't looking as much before the war. Um, but I think there are, certainly are accounts of drumming along the Washita River by black people in the area that would become Monroe, Louisiana. I find that very interesting stuff. There's actually a street in Monroe called Congo Street, which I find that a little interesting too. Uh, I think that there, and, and, I, and mind you, I don't know what kind of drumming is being described. I don't know if these are the cylindrical, conical type of drums we associate with West Africa and the Caribbean. Same thing in Holly Springs. I've got this odd account of a black drummer, apparently was a slave, who when his workday was done would take his drum and beat it on his porch. And the, uh, a white woman was writing this in the commercial appeal in the early 20th century. She's talking about her girl, her hood, but she mentioned that there was a community of Native Americans north of Hudsonville and that the chief's daughter was sick with a fever. And he sent for the drum and asked the black man if he would let his drum be borrowed so that the evil spirit causing the fever could be, getting, could be driven out. And the man said, on the condition that I alone must bring the drum and I must play it because I'm the only one able to play it properly. And the woman said that he dutifully went and beat the drum. And she said, if he did not know how to beat it, he knew nothing because he, he had no other prized possession and he beat it every day. <laughs> but that the chief's daughter died anyway and that the community within a year or two had been uh, forced to move west. Dating that, what kind of drum it was, did the man say, I'm not going to let you borrow it unless I beat it because of some religious significance? We don't know. It's a very interesting recollection from an elderly white woman writing in the 1910 era about what she could recall as a little girl in Marshall County. But it's interesting because it shows an interaction between African Americans and Indians, or Native Americans. It shows that drums were present before the Civil War, 
And it seems to suggest that they had a religious significance, or at least this particular drum and this particular drummer, that there was something, some reason that he was like, no, I'm not going to let you take my drum. I have to bring it, and I've got to play it, because <laughs> you don't know how to play it. It's an interesting, uh, you know, and it's interesting recollection and deep. Uh, I've got that article at home. It's not part of this book, which deals with Tennessee, but it's certainly interesting. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, what about the the fife or the fife, uh, which and of course Jesse May's grandfather also played the pan pipes, which I think his playing was very similar, right, with the fife playing and the pan pipes and uh, called the quills. Quills, yeah. And right. I think there's at least yeah. one other recording from the 1920s of, the, of a quill player. Yeah. Um, and I'm not as familiar with the quills, but certainly uh, the the transverse flutes are found sig are significant in West Africa. So I think that uh, this tradition. But I found at least one other tradition that was interesting is in the Kingdom of the Congo. Once it had been Christianized by contact with the Portuguese, they would have religious processions accompanied by drums and a cane fife. In this case, made out of sugar cane and uh, was actually called a sweet flute in Portuguese, dulce, which because it was made of sugar. It was made of a sugar cane. And so there may even be a Congo origin. We, we, we typically think of Senegal and rightfully so. We know, uh, mm -hmm. Even the 1920s white newspapers were calling black bands Senegambian bands, which I find interesting. I think they probably were simply waxing poetic rather than actually being aware of the fact that, but they were more correct than they knew because, I mean, if you listen to Hill Country Blues, you hear the modes and scales of Wolof and Fulani music, so much so that Gulel Kumba said, why are those Mississippi people playing Senegalese music when he first heard Junior Kimbrough? Uh, he was not, he was uh, mistaken and not mistaken because they were f descended from people from Senegal. But bottle trees are of Congo origin. So when we start going through the Delta and we see people with green and blue and clear bottles on tree trunks and things, we're seeing something that comes from further south, from the Congo. So there's clearly an influence. And I don't think Congo Square was simply the fact that they were black folks. I think they really were from the Congo. And Jerome de Wolf in his book makes that same mm -hmm. contention. Um, and he's the one that mentions this fife made out of sugar cane. Mm -hmm. So there's even a more Central African antecedent for this as well. Right. Oh, I was wondering, in the uh, newspaper ads that you showed us, there was mention of a political campaign. And I was curious as to how often, the, especially in the Reconstruction era in the early 20th century, how often the bands were, were active with, with those campaigns, and, and were there other commercial opportunities for the bands at that time period? Oh, there certainly were, and in my book, I deal with some of them. Uh, some of these guys, particularly uh, Robert Wardlow and Stephen Grayson, who were both from Memphis, were self-professed, at least at first, black Democrats, which was not very common. And they, in fact, Robert Wardlow called it Robert Wardlow's conservative colored band. And uh, he wanted everyone to know that he was allied with the democracy, with the conservatives, with the ex-Confederates. And they rewarded him handsomely for that alliance. They hired him for all their democratic rallies. And, you know, uh, as such, Stephen Grayson starts out the same way, but at some point he's on tour with some Democratic politicians that included uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, and they get to Jackson, Tennessee, and Nathan Bedford Forrest makes this elaborate speech in favor of slavery, Southern slavery, uh, how it was not the monstrous institution it appeared to be, and that actually black people were better off under it. And the next thing you know, you see Stephen Grayson has left the Democratic Party and joined the Republicans, the r radicals, and he's down in Meridian, Mississippi, playing for radical candidates. Uh, it's also interesting that as you study this, uh, it's rare to see 
the words Democrat and Republican used. The Democrats were calling themselves the conservative party, and the Republicans were generally being called the radicals. And it's a very interesting period of time uh, that it was considered radical to treat people equally without regard to race. That's just odd to me that that was considered radical, but it was. And uh, for a while, in the wake of the Confederate uh, debacle, uh, Democrats said, you know, we better kind of cool it with the word Democrat, and so they were calling themselves conservative, the conservative party. <laughs> they, uh, by 1874-75, they were back to clearly calling themselves conservatives. And one of the more pathetic articles I ran into was an editorial from the Tate County Democrat in which the newspaper said, the danger of the radicals taking this county is great. What did the fife and drum mean 10 years ago? It meant domination of the white man by Negroes, and it means the same today under Chalmers. Chalmers had been a Confederate uh, general at uh, Fort Pillow, but he turned course and joined the Republican Party and supported Ulysses Grant, and so he was now being hated, and that the fife and drum music was being associated with black rule over whites uh, is made plain by that editorial, and the Memphis Commercial Appeal reprinted it in their daily. It came from Senatobia, but they reprinted it and spread it around, and so it just shows one of the reasons why there was a considerable amount of white hatred of this music when it was in the public eye. It vanishes, it goes underground, people weren't going out to the rural areas where it was taking place, and it doesn't pop back up until Alan Lomax runs into it in Quitman County in the 40s. Other questions? Yeah, we got some, we got a question from the live stream too. Um, were the fife and drum bands associated with specific denominations? You mentioned they were Christian, were they Baptist? I'm not sure the bands were necessarily Christian, and certainly with the independent pole bearer society, there was no rhyme or reason. Uh, IPB 9, I think, maybe at one time was associated with Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. Nowadays, it's associated with Brown's Missionary Baptist Church in South Haven, Mississippi. IPB 11, on the other hand, was associated with Noah's Chapel AME Church out by Rosemark. And... Um, IPB 6, I think, was associated with Bushgrove Missionary Baptist Church. So the different societies based out of certain churches, but, you know, uh, there doesn't seem to be any denominational restriction. And uh, another IPB chapter was based out of a Methodist church. So it just, there's no... Uh, as far as I can tell, and that's for the musicians, it's just like the ones that were calling themselves conservative. I think some of those guys would put on different color clothes and run and play for a Republican rally the next night. I mean, money's money, and you need the money, and these people knew how to play the game the way it was. You know, they just said, uh, well, the, you know, the... Uh, the ex-Confederates, a lot of them, they've got money, you know. Uh, we may not like their politics, but they're paying. So let's, uh, you know. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Uh, we've learned a lot. But I'd like to ask you, what spurred your interest? How, how, what made you decide that you wanted to look all this up and get to know what was going on? Well, I think some of it was, I, I mentioned a little bit in the foreword of my book. Uh, I had a close friend in high school named Jesse Yancey. He was a, a tailback for our high school football team, and I was out visiting on his front porch one hot summer day, and I heard drums booming. And there was a lot of woods behind his house, and he was one that liked to make little dry jokes. So I asked him, I said, what is all this drumming I'm hearing? And he looked at me kind of half crazy and said, there's a tribe back in those woods. Well, I knew better than that. But I never really got a satisfactory explanation for what I was hearing. And so years later, I ran into Daryl Pugh, who had been with us on that porch that day. And I asked Daryl, what was that years ago? He said something was going on at a lodge. And so that was always in the back of my memory. But then also all my high school years, I was recording black drum lines and majorette drummers and uh, documenting this stuff, saying this stuff could die out. It needs to be recorded. I had a big old boom box 
I didn't know it. I'm just in high school, but I was making field recordings and I was being an ethnomusicologist. I had no idea I was doing that. I didn't know what ethnomusicology was, but I had the typical ethnomusicology mindset. This is vanishing. It's endangered. I better record it. And uh, sure enough, you know, I was already being an ethnomusicologist. So anything that involves drums, and then I had read the book Drums and Shadows, which you have, if you have not read that book, you must read that book. It's a Georgia Works Project Administration book from 1940. And they were looking for African retentions amongst African Americans in the Sea Islands of Georgia. And there's a lot in there about drums, and there's a lot in there about fife and drum, and there's a lot in there about Daddy Grace and the drummers in one of his mission churches. And it's just a very interesting book because it was at a time when a lot of people were saying there aren't any African retentions in African Americans. But there were, and they were found back there in 1940 by these researchers working with Lorenzo Dow Turner. So that book shaped a lot of my thinking, too. And uh, I, I've said a lot as a student and as an ethnomusicologist, just because you take African people and put them in America, they don't quit being African. And I think that's really true. And we need to understand that a lot of the things that we think of as African-American culture are West African in origin or perhaps Caribbean. And uh, these things need to be more detailed and more researched. And so I was really, plus I see this all the time. I've Chardet is a personal friend. I love this music, uh, you know, and uh, I'm always at these picnics and encountering this. So I felt like the generation that knows this music is dying and they need to be interviewed about what they can remember before they're gone because every time we lose an elder, I think an African proverb says, a hundred libraries burn to the ground. So, you know, let's interview these people while we have them and while they're lucid enough to be interviewed to preserve this music and what we can remember from it. Yeah. What um, were you able to um, obtain information about why the women's bands were formed and whether their music differed in any respects from the men's hyphen band groups? I will continue. I will concede that I have never encountered any reference to a female fife and drum band. If there was such a thing, it's news to me. It's certain. I found no reference to it in Tennessee whatsoever. And the only thing I did find that was interesting was that there was a particular fife and drum band in Davidson County, Tennessee, which is Nashville, associated with the minor league baseball franchise. Uh, it was occasionally called an Ethiopian fife and drum band and other times a Senegambian fife and drum band. Its actual name was the Spirits of 76. And they were hired by the Women's Suffrage League in 1916 to play for their rally in Nashville where they were demanding the right to vote for women. And I found this so interesting that this group of rather proper white women in Tennessee hired a black fife and drum band to play for their rally at which they were trying to get the legislature to let women vote. So I found that very interesting and, uh, but I have not encountered any reference to a female fife and drum band. There may have been such a thing. I did find a reference to a Choctaw fife and drum band in Neshoba County that played at a ball game, and I found that very interesting and wondered if there had been influence from the African-American tradition. But, I, you know, aside from that, I've not run into any reference to a, such a female group. Uh, I did Mayor Crump in Memphis. Did he use any of those music groups? Mayor Crump, I mean, well, in Crump, campaign. No, you know, Memphis was a city. And by the time Crump came along, we're right on the early verge of World War I. Out in the rurals beyond Memphis, you had these fife and drum bands. In other words, out by Bartlett, Bengistown, Rosemark, Millington, Cordova, Mount Pisgah, and Collierville, and Capeville, all out in the rurals, you had this. Inside the city, you had brass bands, of which the two biggest were Eckford's Orchestra and Handy's. Han uh, we have listings of the members of both because of uh, Green Polonius Hamilton's wonderful book, The Bright Side of Memphis, which has been reprinted, one of the very first 
books by published books by a black Memphian. And uh, it lists all the musicians by name who were members of those two orchestras and lists, interestingly, that the drummer of each was played the traps. And this is 1908, which shows that the drum set is much older than the 1925 patent. But no, Crump used Handy's band primarily, and Handy wrote a song that later got words that weren't very flattering to Crump uh, that said... Uh, Crump won't allow no easy riders here. We don't care what Crump don't allow. We're going to barrel a house anyhow. Uh, but they probably never sang it that way when Crump was present. Um, that later gets recorded by Frank Stokes and uh, eventually ends up in the repertoire of a wonderful Memphis band called uh, Mud Boy and the Neutrons, but that's another whole story. Yeah, the, it intrigues me that, accidental or not, that you were recording these sounds of music, the bands that you were hearing when you were in high school. Yeah. So I'm assuming with a boombox you're on cassette somewhere. Well, yeah, and I'm <laughs> in the process of transferring much of that to uh, digital format, but it's, it's an ongoing and lengthy process. But yes, I made a lot of recordings, some of them of black high school marching bands and drum lines, some of them of college drum lines, Jackson State and others. Eventually I recorded some jazz groups like the Improvisational Arts Quintet and Alvin Fielder. So, you know, I've got a lot in my archive of field recordings and they, they, they all are going to be digitized, Lord willing, but uh, it's, it's an ongoing process. I know we've got a few more questions, both in the live stream and here, but we are a little past the top of the hour. However, I would encourage you to come ask John Shaw a uh, your question and uh, maybe pick up a copy of his book. We have them for sale over here. Thank you all for being here today. Come back next Wednesday when we'll have Faye Yarborough talking about her new book, Chalk Talk Confederates. Help me thank John Shaw once more for this program. Thank you.